of all, thank all of you for coming out. Um, really excited to be here. Great turnout. Uh, you know, it's uh, an exciting time in 2018. This is the year we're hopefully going to make some serious change uh, right here in the Hudson Valley and uh, the Casco. So I'm excited to get to talk to you, uh, give you a sense of who I am as a person uh, and why I'm doing this. Now, why? Right? That is, I'm already done. <laughs> That's a quick clock. <laughs> so, so let me let me tell you. Um, you know, everybody talks a lot about what happened in, in 2016, and, and Trump uh, obviously uh, has a lot to do with uh, what compelled me uh, to action. But I, I want to talk a little bit about what came before Trump. Um, sort of a, a pattern of uh, a practice of neglect uh, that led to where he ended up and got us to this point. Now you have to understand that history, the last 30 or 40 years now, to fully understand how we got here. Uh, and, and it's that tipping point that we're now at now that's compelling me to action. Uh, I grew up in Schenectady. I'm 40 years old. I grew up in a working class family, a working class neighborhood. Uh, my parents worked for GE for many, many years. It was a different time, pre-globalization, pre the advancement of technology, uh, a time when Families all across this region could rely on jobs at IBM or at GE that employed thousands of people and be secure in the fact that they could work their way up into the middle class with hard work. My family was that family. Uh, we started off in a number of apartments. I remember cutting coupons and putting clothes on layaway, having hand-me-down clothes in my neighborhoods, not being as safe, but over time they got safer. And we got our first house when I was in high school. I was a latchkey kid. At 10 years old, doing my homework every single night, my parents would come back home and say, where's the homework? My mom brought out the red pen, which back then was terrifying. Uh, but they were believing in education. And I benefited from my education. It was my gateway to opportunity. They preached it every day. And I went on to have a really successful life by virtue of the values that were instilled in me, the jobs that they had, the structure that we were afforded as a family. I went on to Colgate and played basketball, went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, got my law degree at Harvard, but I never forgot where it started and what was afforded to us. Now fast forward 30, 40 years. What's happened to our education? Three presidential debates, no questions about education, no focus on the gateway to opportunity anymore. What happened to those jobs? The GEs, the IBMs have shipped their jobs off overseas. The economy's doubled in size over this same period of time, but wages have remained stagnant. 80% of the country right now owns just 7% of the wealth, two-thirds paycheck to paycheck they're living now. More than half of the folks who are on food stamps are fully employed. <coughs> Think about that. We have shifted from public good to private greed. And it's been happening now for a good 30, 40 years at the expense of the vast majority of working families. So we talk about Trump, but you can't ignore how we got here. And I know and I remember what it took. I lived it. I understand the values, the focus. I, I, I can empathize with the struggle. And I think that's what compelled me. It's that recognition, that critical moment where I said, oh my goodness, we, we have gone too far. We are too far adrift right now. And it is absolutely imperative that we get this thing back on track. Now. Thank you. The second question that I have for you is approximately 47% of eligible voters do not vote. Student turnout is very low. <coughs> People that voted for President Obama twice helped elect President Trump. What are your plans to reach these disaffected voters? Now you ask about young voters or just Both. voters in general? Both. Okay, because I want to add a few more facts to that. 160,000 folks or so voted for FASA, 140 or so voted for TJ. 178,000 people in this district were registered to vote and did not vote. 100,000 were eligible for enrollment eligible for enrollment and were not enrolled, and therefore could not vote. That's 278,000 people out there. And now, Teach Out lost by 27,000 votes. That's 27,000. So this is a critical question. 
And it is about turning out the vote. We, as Democrats, as progressives, we win when people feel like we speak to the heart, when we connect to our values, when we're principled, when we have our ethics in order, and we have a vision for the future. What's happened is our politics have gotten completely adrift from our core set of principles. Understanding that what it takes on a moral level to connect with people is just as important on a policy level. Now, more than ever. Now, when I got out of uh, Colgate, you know, I did not practice law right away. I spent four or five years out in LA. I started my own music company. I, like many folks right now who are on the sidelines, thought, I don't believe in this system. I don't think it's going to do enough for the people who are hurting, for the folks that I know from my community who have been marginalized on the sidelines. So I created my own company and tried to figure out how to use hip hop culture to touch young people's lives. Now, my parents were a little confused by that, uh, but it meant something to me. So I can understand that energy, that apathy, because there are times with all the money in politics, all the talking past each other, but it does feel like it doesn't matter. Nothing changes on the ground. It's just politics as usual. Just like the shutdowns going on now. No one can agree on anything. The only people who benefit is the status quo. So you know how you engage and get people inspired? First of all, you speak truth to that fact. And you speak to people's hearts and minds. And you say, it's time now. It's time now to rely on who we are as people, as citizens, not as consumers, but as citizens, we have an obligation to own who we are as people of this country and to fight for our values. And it's important to have an advocate who reminds us of that fact. Sometimes you need that. You need somebody to remind you who you are and what we're about. And I come from that. So I think I have that ability to tap into young people, to tap into the folks who are disenfranchised, tap into people who are just tired of this. Because I'm tired of it too. But it's time now to stand up. We got too much on the line to not to. <coughs> As you travel around the district, what are you hearing from small business owners and farmers about what is important to them and how are your solutions different than FASO's? That's a great question. So one of the things that I've, uh, no matter where I go, and I've been to every county, talk to a number of farmers, dairy, fruit, vegetable, small business owners, I've been everywhere. And the common theme is the lack of opportunity, the lack of a vision for the 19, the Hudson Valley and the Cascades. What does the future look like? Right? A lot of folks fear that their children are growing up in a place where they're going to have to leave to find opportunity elsewhere. That's the reality that people are living in right now. There's an angst. That's about that. Now, there's a critical piece that we can do to fix this. And it's not that complicated. It's called investing in local. It's called investing from the ground up. That old model that I talked about earlier, the GEs and the IVs, the sort of top-down model, the trickle-down model, doesn't work now. The world's too big. We have to have a government that recognizes you start small. You invest and you empower small business growth. And you can do that any number of ways. Let's first focus on small business. Instead of a god-awful tax plan, it just gets a blank check to big corporations. How about we focus on small businesses and say, you know what? Your first $50,000 in startup costs, write them off. Your new business, your first million in investments, write it off. If you had a home office, let's create a standard deduction that you can actually work there and not complicate yourself too much around your paperwork. This is how you actually create and engineer entrepreneurship on a small level. Agriculturally speaking, massive trends are happening right now in the food supply chain. You got a lot of folks who are looking for organic, locally grown food. Less and less for sugar-based products. Seven billion dollars right now of unmet demand in New York City. Seven billion dollars. And we can't tap into it because we have no infrastructure. No regional distribution plants. No regional processing plants. No broadband access to incentivize investment here. No wireless service to incentivize investment here. None of it is here to tap into that. What happens about a market initiative program? How can we tap into that and export the goods that we have and feed the families that are here? Food that's just all around this place. Right, so how do we do that? What we don't do is what Faso and Trump are doing, which is to literally cut the budget for the USDA and rural development in the market access program. Day one, I'm saying double that budget. We have to put money where we know it's needed. We have to get back to focusing on re-energizing 
our communities all across this district. So you identify those growth opportunities, and then you invest, and you make sure that you can meet that unmet demand both in the city and locally all throughout this district. Okay. How would you translate your democratic values to reach a wider audience in the more traditionally Republican areas of the district? Yeah. So <clears throat> the way I look at this is, at the end of the day, yes, there's left, there's right, liberal, conservative, but there's also something that sort of transcends politics. It's called integrity. Uh, it's called authenticity. Uh, it's called honesty, civility, respect. These, these things aren't, they don't come with an R or a B attached to it. Right? This is just how your parents hopefully raised you. Right? That's how I was raised. Um, and I think there has to be a point now, particularly right now, where we as Democrats uh, can reach across the aisle and lean heavily on these shared values. And we have a congressman in John Faso, at least with regard to his behavior, that does not seem to reflect these values or share these values. I don't know how you can look a woman in the eye, promise her when she has a brain tumor and a spinal condition that I'm going to make sure you keep your health care and then turn around and vote for the bill that takes away her health care. Put the health care issue aside for a second. What about your work? You don't make a promise to somebody like that and then break it. And you definitely don't make that kind of promise and break it and then sh not show up and explain yourself. <laughs> the man is called No Show Fazo. And it's sticking. It's sticking because he's not showing up. He's not doing his job. Accountability, leadership, these are the things that go cut across the aisle here. Um, those are the things that I want to focus on. And I think. You know, I, I try to demonstrate, uh, but my commitment to this region, by my willingness to understand and, uh, and learn the local issues and come up with a real vision for the folks here. That's what people deserve from their representative. It's representation. So in addition to some of the things that you've already discussed, can you uh, tell us three positions that you have that will help you get elected to New York 19? We're just going to give you just pick, pick three different ones. We we'll probably have more. We're going to just ask you to focus on three. Well, let's start with what I just said in terms of the agricultural development, rural development stuff. I think focusing on how we can empower small business owners uh, through the means that I've, I've discussed um, and, and focusing on the agricultural space is one of the key ways. And I'll just link in because I've already said that. The piece to this is you're feeling the damn, uh, sorry, excuse my French, the, the, uh, that god awful tax reform, that tax cut, we can call it, tax scam. Uh, it is uh, at the heart of what's wrong with the culture in DC, uh, just like that attempt to repeal the ACA. We're going to take uh, from the most vulnerable and just give uh, to those who don't need it. A blank check to corporations at the expense of everybody. So making sure we actually give a tax break to middle class families, right? Those making less than $125,000 a year. Making sure we actually empower small business owners uh, and use the savings we get from repealing that tax plan to hardworking families, that's the first step. The other step here, I would say, is environment, renewable energy. Um, we have a beautiful, beautiful, well, we are a beautiful region. Um, the Catskills, and the Hudson River, everything about this place is gorgeous. It's majestic. Um, and not just the tourism aspect that we should be thinking about, but you know, the clean air, the clean water uh, is tremendously important. 100,000 folks rely on the Hudson River. Uh, for their water. And it's still infected. There's still chemicals in it. It's going to take 40, 50 years. Uh, there's still rising sea levels. Uh, they're going to put our waterfronts at risk. Uh, and they're going to require real investment in infrastructure. Uh, we have to acknowledge that climate change is real. And we have to make sure that we shift away from the fossil fuel industry and focus heavily on renewable energy. That means instead of propping up the fossil fuel industry with over $4 billion of corporate welfare a year, you take those tax incentives and you use them to spur growth in the renewable energy space, whether it's solar. Which, by the way, it's growing at 17 times the rate of the economy, solar jobs. Wind turbine technicians, one of the fastest growing jobs in the country, but no training there for it. Right, so that's another piece, making sure that we commit from fossil fuel to renewable energy. And then I would also argue that the biggest employer in this district right now, hospitals, right? So healthcare is a big issue. Uh, massively important issue. Uh, so it's not just about our health, but it's also about the economics of it. A lot of folks 
uh, in this district. 30,000 folks, in fact, rely on Medicaid. And you have the opioid epidemic that's ongoing. Many of the drug treatment centers that fund, uh, or a lot of funding that goes to treating uh, the opioid epidemic, Medicaid. So when you hear folks like Congressman Faisal say, you know, I want to deal with the opioid epidemic, it's a real issue, it's a real concern of mine, out of one side of his mouth, but then on the other side of his mouth, saying he wants to roll back the Medicaid expansion, doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. Right? And so focusing on how we can make universal coverage for everybody. I personally think we can get there by letting folks opt into Medicaid or Medicare. Create a public competitor in the market. This will drive down premiums, it will drive down deductibles, and it will keep the insurance companies who we all know at one point we need out of this system. Honest. The other piece of this though is prescription drug companies. Uh, the fact that Medicare cannot negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry is a crime. The fact that prescription drug companies can sell their products overseas for cheaper than they do their own folks here, a crime. The fact that prescription drug companies can pay off generic brand companies, keep their products shelved so they can keep gouging us, a crime. Right? We have to fight back against this prescription company and screw the whole industry. They've got our folks in Congress a hostage right now, bought and paid for. Uh, and it's important that we have folks in Congress who are going to stand up and call it for what it is. Thank you. I think that's a good tie into the next question I have. So if you are elected, what would be the first bill you would sponsor? Yeah, I got a lot of them. I got a lot of them. But here's, here's what jumps to my mind. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple that come to mind, um, and, and, I, and they're kind of fitting. In, in light of the last couple days. Um, uh, one of them is the Fairness Paycheck Act. Um, I think it's high time now that we as a country um, deal with the fact that, uh, which is insane, that women still uh, make 70 cents on the dollar mm -hmm. compared yeah. to men. That is, it doesn't make any sense. It, 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 it defies any bit of reason. Um, it is grotesque, uh, and I have a problem with that. And I think, relatedly, uh, family, uh, paid family leave. We're one of the only developed countries in the world that have no paid family leave. It gets back to values, right? It gets back to understanding that family matters. It's not just about slaving and working all day just to go buy something on the internet, right? It's about sharing and embracing your community and loving your family and your friends. We have to institutionalize that behavior. And we're not doing that. Uh, I think that's a, a very important piece, too. Then the Government for the People Act. I think that's a good one as well. Uh, that makes it easier for folks to get into politics who don't have money. You know, we all know that one of the biggest problems right now in our system is money in politics. Uh, I can tell you right now, it is brutal. Uh, you have to raise money to survive in this world. Uh, and, and it's one of the things that I least like about this process. Uh, that in order to succeed, uh, to be deemed, quote unquote, viable, you have to sort of pay your way in into our democracy. And that's just not right. Uh, and in the system where you have so much inequality, so much staggering inequality, I read somewhere that the top 1% uh, make 20, 30% of the income. It's a lot of income that's being made at top 1%, right? And, and then they could use all that money that they have and, and, and dictate for us how our government's going to function. Buy our politicians off. And now with Citizens United allowing unlimited amounts of money into this, what do we do, right? So I think it's important that we certainly deal with this, and I think Government for the People Act is one way to do that as well. Great. So kind of tying a little bit into what you said about the issue with um, women's rights, what have you done in your career to advance women in the workplace for paid family medical leave, and do you support women's rights? <laughs> yeah, I, I sure do. Uh, and, I, and on that point, I want to say, you know, we, a lot of times people ask me, you know, uh, what about, uh, what are you going to really focus on with FASA? What are the issues, you know? I mean, healthcare is going on that. Bad. The fact that he has no town halls, bad. Uh, but I got to tell you, uh, he is not a friend to women. He's just not. You know, the facts bear this out. Uh, you know, he voted six times no equal pay for equal work when he was a state assembly. Uh, 
called Roe v. Wade a black mark uh, on the country, uh, decided that it was okay to vote for a bill uh, that essentially makes it a pre-existing condition to be a woman. <laughs> but it was okay, and did so on the first version, which did not even make its way to the floor. That's how bad it was. But he said, count me in. That was his Me Too version, right? <laughs> so that, that's, that's where he's coming from with this. Um, and I think uh, it's high time that we put people in office uh, who understand uh, that that kind of behavior, uh, that kind of thinking is outdated. It's gone. Uh, it, we, we cannot tolerate that thinking anymore. Uh, and so I spent my entire life, first and foremost, being raised by a powerful woman uh, who instilled me the very values that I speak of to this day. Uh, I married a woman who was a career-oriented woman uh, and a splendid mother and wife who also uh, has helped me to understand the value of this from my, throughout my adult life. Uh, and as a professional, uh, when I served on the diversity committee at the firm that I worked at, it was very important uh, to make sure that we always try to figure out ways uh, to deal with any potential sexual harassment claims or getting in front of these issues and making people feel comfortable about sharing their own stories in the event that there were any such stories. Uh, and I worked closely with particularly young African-American women uh, who were trying to buy their own way into this male-dominated and oftentimes white male-dominated corporate space. Uh, they had to find an ally. They needed to find a mentor uh, to make them feel comfortable and understand how to have conversations in these difficult spaces. And I took that role very seriously. Thank you. And one final... One final question for you, and before we turn it to the audience, and this one is a candidate-specific question. Mm -hmm. So for you, you have a background in law and music, and could you elaborate how do, how do these, both the law and your music business, fit into the general portrait of who you are? That's a great question. Um, so it's a, almost a, uh, a tale of two, <laughs> two stories, <laughs> two paths. Um, you know, when I was growing up, one of the, the biggest things that I learned, um, uh, my parents were very, very steadfast in making sure I understood the legacy of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you know, we marched every Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, we had the books you know, all across the coffee table. Um, it was important. Uh, and they wanted me to understand uh, the legacy of, of justice uh, and what it means to fight for equality in this country. And of course, as an African American, you know that was one way to understand that story. But as a woman, another way. You know, as a, as a gay individual, another way. You know, there's always ways to understand it. That's how I figured out my narrative. And I've always, for the life that I've, that I've led, thought about how do I serve in that capacity? How do I bring us together? You know, how do I unify? How do I fight for a more fair and just world? Now, when I graduated from uh, law school. You know, there were a lot of offers to go and work at law firms then, um, and I chose not to. Uh, I wanted to spend the time that I spent, five or six years, uh, struggling, I might add, um, as an artist, uh, working with young people, uh, trying to figure out how to connect uh, through music, through hip hop culture, which back then, you know, I think now it's a pretty popular form of music, uh, and it was back then, um, but it was hard uh, to break in, because I was trying to figure out how to speak in a way that was positive. Uh, that didn't just buy into the stereotypes and talk about criminals and, and guns and violence, but talk about hope and education and excellence, the things that we all need to survive and thrive in this society. Uh, and then turn from there, we started to focus on my own personal life and my family. I wanted to be a father. I wanted to be a husband. Uh, I wanted to support my family. And I wanted to also understand the language of finance. Uh, I'll speak again as an African American. Uh, we have, at this point, been shut out for a lot of years. Uh, in this world, the world of finance. Um, and a lot of folks have struggled to get that access. Uh, it's not a mystery, uh, to me at least, that why African Americans only have, uh, or let's just say white people have 12 times the wealth uh, on average than, than black families. Um, so understanding that access, uh, being the one of the only African Americans to work in the law firm that I was working at, getting close to understand how this world works financially was critically important to me, uh, particularly coming after working in the community space. Uh, and being able to marry those two worlds uh, and blend them together in a way that I think uh, makes me a more complete person uh, and more thorough in terms of how I go about the business of what I, seek out, what I want to do right now, in fact. Uh, as both a litigator and somebody who understands the law and has reviewed and written contracts, 
uh, but also as an advocate for young people who've been disenfranchised and marginalized. I think all those pieces come together, uh, put together a, a nice set of experiences that allow me to do the work that I'm here to do. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to questions from the audience. And just a reminder to please uh, stand, state your name, your town, and try to keep it to a question so we can get through as many questions as possible and not commentary. I'm going to start right in the back. Okay. Andy Weiss Bartzak from Gardner. I, I know the last candidate, perhaps some before that, hired uh, high paid campaign managers from out of the district who, of course, didn't know what, anything about the district. So if you have a campaign manager, where does this person uh, come from? Yeah, yes, yeah, good question. So my campaign manager uh, has worked several campaigns. Her last campaign was in Syracuse. Um, she definitely is not from this area. Uh, it is pretty common uh, that when you hire a campaign manager, um, that that person you want to have had some sort of experience having run campaigns before, particularly congressional campaigns. Uh, and usually people who run congressional campaigns don't stay in the same spot. They, they're working different campaigns across the country. So you want to look for people who have that experience. That being said, you want to have field organizers and you want to have folks on your staff who are locally grown and who understand the lay of the land and know where to connect with folks all throughout this district. That's why one of my most important hires was our field director, who, by the way, was responsible for running uh, the field program for the Dutchess County local elections just last year. Um, and so it's important to understand that we do have people on our team uh, who have that know-how, who do have that experience, uh, and understand the lay of the land. A lot of candidates wanted Christian, that's his name, uh, and I was fortunate enough to get him. Um, and so, yes, we have those, and we have folks across the counties, uh, kitchen cabinets that we created. Uh, so whether I'm in Otsego, whether I'm in Delaware, whether I'm in Ulster, there's folks that I can seek out, sit down with, and understand the issues and learn, okay, locally, what's pressing right here? How can we engage? Uh, so it's, it's a combination. Uh, but you're right, there is a real gap. Uh, and I've learned this talking with folks uh, who've been around here and, and went through a number of congressional races with certain candidates. The DCCC kind of comes in, they parachute in with their people, none of whom have any connection to the area. They don't know the local leaders, the activist groups. They just come with a bunch of money and they say, let us go. And that's not how we could function now. Not if we want a real grassroots campaign that's grounded in the community and gives folks a chance to understand how they can have a voice in this process. And that's exactly the kind of campaign that I want to run. Say right here. And Harry will hold the microphone while you speak into it. I'll okay. make it clear for everyone. Hi, I'm Kathy Adorney. I live in Gardner also. And I'm wondering, do you have any ideas on how to use your background in music to get young people out for the vote? I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> As I noted, hip hop is the most popular form of music uh, uh, in the world. In the world. And not to get too nostalgic here, but to think where the culture started from um, to where it is now, it was quite uh, a feat. Um, that is a window into uh, my youthful spirit. Um, and, I, and I think particularly when it comes to the number of community colleges on throughout the district, the SUNY schools, uh, and I can tell you I don't want to give too much away right now, but I've been working with a lot of the schools across the district, uh, trying to make sure that I build relationships, uh, working to have forums, uh, and not even all the time dealing with politics per se, you know, just going in and talking about my career in music, right, and using that as a gateway to connect. Uh, talking about the fact that sometimes politics can be, uh, you know, a turnoff, and, and explaining how I can relate to that fact. Um, you know, there's a point that I think, uh, as a, I'm 40, um, so I think I'm still relatively young. I remember um, when I was really, really young that one of the things that I really liked about a, a political person, if I was looking to connect, was uh, their relatability. You know, how can they speak to me in a way that was informed by passion? You know, the older you get, the more practical you get. Um, but when you're young, there's still an energy about you that you can do anything you want. Um, and and I, I still kind of live by that, too. Um, and it's being able to speak to that uh, and, and being able to point to life experiences that say, yeah, I, not only do I speak to it, I've, I've lived it. I've, I slept on air mattresses and worked as a parking lot attendant, attendant with a Harvard Law degree because I was doing something that was passionate about. And my parents were confused, for sure. <laughs> and I had that, a lot of debt hanging over my head for those five, six years. Uh, but it felt so good. Uh, it felt so right.
to do that. And, and, and I can relate. Um, and so being able to share my story in that way um, is how I think I can really help young people uh, get excited about what we're doing. Say, this guy, you know what? I gotta relate to him. <laughs> Stay in the back for a minute. Um, right. Right here. Catherine Pulling from Clinton Corners. Uh, you mentioned the importance of education, and I wonder what uh, what you would imagine doing if you were elected to Congress to improve education. I love this question. That is, after I mean, there's you know people say I'm an eye to answer questions, big questions. So there's my top level issues: economic opportunity. Uh, but right after that, right, right there is education. Uh, I am the product uh, of education. Uh, I understand how important education is. It is everything when it comes to what I've been able to accomplish in my life from where I started. Um, and so I understand how important it is that we prioritize. Now, let's think of this from the ground up. Um, let's start just from pre-K, uh, universal pre-K, number one. Uh, the fact that this is not even a topic of national conversation to me uh, is disturbing. Uh, we have to reach kids early. Uh, those are the most formative years, the most impressionable years. Give them structure. Give them a sense that what it means to learn and be educated early, early on. Right? Being read to is critically important. Uh, so universal pre-K. And then the curriculum from K through 12. We've got to redo this thing. We are still operating on this assumption that everybody who goes to high school will go off to a four-year college and live happily ever after. Not in today's global economy, they won't. You know, let's make sure that our curriculum reflects the needs of the surrounding community. There's a great program called the Ulster County, at Ulster County Community College called the Pathways Program. It's funded by the state and federal government. It takes kids from the Kingston School District, uh, brings them on the community college campus in a six-year program, a STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math. And those kids learn those areas of study, and the curriculum matches the needs of the small business owners in the community around. So that when those kids graduate, they're prepared to take on the jobs that are available to them. We don't do that enough. We have to model those kind of programs out. Get back to apprenticeship programs, vocational schools, and trade schools. Give folks hard skills. One of the saddest stories I ever heard as I traveled across this district is a teacher who told me, she drives to school, she still sees kids who just graduated from her, from her school, from her high school, just kind of wandering around aimlessly. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. Uh, that's sad, we gotta change that. And the lastly, I think at the collegiate level, you know, 30, 40 years ago, Pell Grant would cover 70% of a four-year high school or college education. Now it's down to 30%. 30%? 30%, really? Pell Grants are critically important for the welfare of our young people from lower income households. Critically important. We're shutting them out of the process. And then if you go to school, you take a loan out, you're saddled with debt, there's no job opportunities for you out there. So how about some loan forgiveness programs? National service opportunities. If you go to Teach for America, or if we go to the Peace Corps, we'll forgive your debt. If you go into this program or this area of study, we'll forgive your debt. Those are the kind of things we have to get back to if you really want to empower our young people and make sure that our education system works for the future. Okay. And I'm from Pleasant Valley. Um, I wrote that on my and I'm going to contextualize a little bit first. Uh, we are the only people of color in this world. Is that um, yeah. And this is something <laughs> I'm constantly reminded of in the context of everyday life and in the context of raising a mixed race child. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, how do you position yourself in the national conversation about race, racism, and structural racism? And how do you bring that to a community where it's not directly relevant to the overwhelmingly Caucasian majority? Yeah. And then on top of that, how do you transcend the structural racism that exists here when putting together your campaign? Let's clap it up that question. So there's a lot of levels to that question. And as an attorney, I listen to everything. I, I try to answer everything. Uh, so if I miss something, please tell me that I didn't answer something. Uh, let's just start um, sort of on, the, on the, the macro level of race in America. Um, and, and the fact that we have a president uh, who started essentially his presidential campaign uh, by questioning the citizenship of the first African American president. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Um, the legacy of white supremacy uh, lives in this country. It continues to breathe in this country. As I noted earlier, um, you know, the median uh, wealth of, of white families is 12 times higher. 
African Americans are locked up twice as much. And it's not because we're black. Uh, it's because of structural impediments that have been put in place for decades, for decades, for decades in this country without any real attempt uh, to deal with the legacy of slavery, the legacy of Jim Crow, the legacy of the Federal Housing Authority redlining and literally creating the ghettos that we now look to and say, oh my goodness, how that happened? Well, our government created those things. Yep. Okay, that's how they happened. We didn't create them. Uh, they were created. Um, so this is the legacy that we're dealing with here. Um, and that's the reality that we have to cope with. Um, it's not lost on me that if I win, I'll say when I win, um, <laughs> that I will be the first African American congressman to represent this district. Um, it's not lost on me. But it's also not lost on me that that's not why I'm running. Uh, why I am running and why I decided to do this was not because I want to be the first black whatever, it's because I give a damn about the people in this area that I call home, that my wife grew up in, that my children are living in, and I want to make sure that I can fight for a better way for everybody here all across this district. One of the questions that I get asked the most, and your question kind of hints at this, is how are you going to win in this kind of district? How can you do it? How can you reach people in this district who voted for Obama twice and then voted for Trump? Well, number one, let's not forget the fact they voted for Obama twice. <laughs> Let's not forget that fact. And I think what Obama was able to do was be authentic, uh, demonstrate that he cared, and that he really wanted to help. That's the first piece. You have to be able to do the work and get out there and connect. I think it also helps that my roots are, are, are grounded in a working class element, um, that I come from struggle, uh, that I come from a story of upward mobility. Uh, and that story, that American story, it's a story that cuts across race, it transcends race. It's something that all of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, understand this is the heartbeat. It's the spirit of America. This notion that we can get by if we get a good education, if we get a good job, we play by the rules. There's an opportunity that waits for you. It's not guaranteed, but you got a chance. When I was growing up, you had a better than 50, 50 chance to climb a class ladder. It's now down to 30%. We used to be number one in the Western world in upward mobility. Now we're dead last. These things transcend race. Right? Mine is the story of a little black boy growing up having that experience. But now it's happening to everybody. And we're all filling the boot. Right? So it's being able to articulate that struggle and that pain from my individual perspective, but then broadening it out and touching people's hearts in a way that's meaningful. So I'm happy to speak about the legacy of racism and how we've got to fix it. We can talk about specific policy prescriptions that deal with that, whether it's criminal justice reform, which I had a lot of work in as an attorney. Um, but I think it's just as important to make sure that we deal with those kitchen counter issues, the economics, you know, that allow them to understand, okay, this person right here, he gets it. And then lastly, this is the last point I'll make on this, unless you want to follow up. Um, I've had a lot of progressives ask me this. Uh, people who I consider on my team, uh, who believe in racial equality, uh, who believe in racial justice, uh, they make the question, how are you going to win? How are you going to convince uh, those folks out there who, who don't like you because you're black? You know what? I don't think I'm going to be able to convince folks who don't like me because I'm black that they should vote for me. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Just like if they don't like women or if they don't like a gay person, you're not going to convince them. Uh, what we have to worry about is how we get ourselves off our butts and go to the polls and show up and turn out. Because when we show up and when we turn out, we win. There's more of us that believe in these things. There's more of us who believe in equality. I'll be damned if I live in a country where that is not the case. I can't. And so it's up to us to believe in who we say we are and then to be it. Don't vote me because I'm black, obviously. Please don't do that. No. <laughs> however, however though, however, understand that you should never question whether or not I can win this district because I'm black. If you're questioning that, you need to go back to yourself and ask, what are you doing? How are you aligning yourself with your principles? Because that's the energy that you can give off. As soon as you act like you can't do that, then the battle's over. We've lost already.
I, I noticed uh, on the uh, website of the law firm at which you're employed that the, the law firm uh, features a, uh, it's a collaboration with Walmart in providing for uh, uh, medical services for poor and sick children. And my question is whether it would be more constructive for your law firm or for you to advise Walmart that these children would not be so poor and sick if Walmart paid a decent wage and provided decent uh, health insurance uh, for their parents so that the kids wouldn't be poor and sick in the first place. Amen. Uh, I mean, I, wrap it up. 100% agree with you. Uh, and I, and I, let me take that question because I think the core of that question is really about the fact that I've worked at a corporate law firm for the last six, seven years. So let's talk about that. Um, I'm very proud of the work uh, that I've done at Aiken Gump. Aiken Gump is one of the most reputable law firms in the country. When my parents found out that I was going to go there, they were thrilled. Um, uh, this is a firm uh, that has uh, 19 offices across the globe. They're all over the place. Uh, over 900 attorneys that do all types of different things. Um, there's a lobbying firm in DC. I'm not a lobbyist. I've been a lobbying day in my life uh, and never will. Um, there's uh, the finance firm in New York, which is where I work. Uh, there's firms everywhere across the country that do different kinds of work. Uh, so there's a diverse group of folks that do a diverse group of things. Uh, you look at my track record uh, and what I focused on, um, I'm happy to tell you uh, that I'm proud of every case that I worked on uh, and how I approached every case uh, and defended all of my clients and was an advocate in the most uh, abstaining way that I could be. Uh, pro bono hours, hundreds of them, uh, I tallied up during my time. Aiken Gums were the only white shoe law firms in the country, by white shoe I mean corporate, uh, that counts all of your billable hours, all of your pro bono hours as billable hours. Not every firm does that. Um, so, as you might imagine, I took full advantage of that. Um, and, and, and worked a lot of hours pro bono, it's particularly around criminal justice reform. It's a very personal issue for me. I have cousins that are locked up still to this day uh, because of those draconian, uh, drug laws back in the 80s and 90s, uh, and it's got awful. Uh, I did a lot of work with juvenile lifers, uh, young kids who've been locked up since they were 15, 16 years old on mandatory life sentences without possibility of parole. And this was the law of the land before Miller v. Alabama, which deemed it a violation of the Eighth Amendment in 2012, hallelujah. But what happens is you have all these young men, a lot of them black men, who've been locked up for 20, 30 years. One of my clients was a little 15-year-old kid who was bullied into an alleyway by a 25-year-old drug dealer in his community. He had no parents at home, nobody watched after him. Kid goes in the alleyway, he then leaves. The kid that he bullied, that he pulled in, gets shot and killed, sentenced to felony murder. Right? Now he was bullied in. He wasn't even there when the, the gun was pulled. But he happened to be a part of the, the crime. No mitigating factors considered, just thrown away in jail, left to rot. 20, 30 years. And this is one of 300 African American men in Philadelphia alone. This is not an exception to the rule. It's the rule, right? And so we have to figure out how to deal with this as well. And I spent a lot of time at Young doing that work as well. One more question. That's uh, it. Possibly two, if we can squeeze two in. I'm going to have Carrie come over here to the front. Hi, my name is Maggie Bevin. I've met you before. Yes. Good to see you again. Um, could you tell us about um, how you are building trust in relation to um, <clears throat> funding of your campaign? Because um, you, you mentioned before there's some truth and there's some non truths to what. Um, maybe going around there. Could you talk about that a yes. little bit? Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Um, people have asked the question, like, they, 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 they said, you know, what, what makes you different from the other candidates? Like, what, why, why you? Um, I'm going to move your question into this. Um, I think it starts with uh, my story, my work ethic, uh, where I come from. I mean, I was raised uh, to work my butt off. I was told from day one, I was going to have to work twice as hard, uh, and I've done it ever since. So I, I know what it means to work uh, and to go to every corner of this district, to earn every vote. Um, and I understand the story of upward mobility because I've lived it, and I can speak it. Um, and I've applied that work ethic to our ability to fundraise. 
make no mistake about it, as much as I hate money uh, in politics, uh, I'm not going to be a fool uh, and not do what I have to do to get in and win. There's nothing I can do from the outside. I want to win, and I want to get in to fight for the very things that I talked with you about today. And that means you have to raise money to do it. Practically speaking, you have to. Forget the politics. Just practically, you have to be able to raise money to touch 700,000 people in a district that's over 7,000 square miles. That is vastly rural. So you just can't just keep knocking on doors. You gotta, you know, drive and have field organizers, satellite offices. You have to have TV ad box. You have to have all of that. And you need money to do that. There are four media markets in this district. One of which is New York City. <coughs> Want to buy an ad in New York City? It's going to cost a lot of money. This is the reality. We're competing against John Fazza, who was backed by the Mercer family, which gave $10 million to Breitbart, the platform for the alt-right. This is real here. Let's go in with our eyes wide open. It's going to take that. So I'm happy to say that I'm the only candidate that can say I've outraised John Fazza every single quarter in 2017. Every quarter. I raised $1.5 million. That is double the next challenger in this race. Now, every cent has come from an individual, not a dollar from a corporate pack. Remember that. Some folks like to deal with misinformation campaigns. The truth is, all of it comes from individuals. And it's from everywhere. I won't pretend to say that some of it's, none of it's from outside the district. Yes, there's some that comes from outside the district. There's a lot of that comes from inside the district. We're going at it from everywhere, wherever we can get it, because we're going to need it. I'm also proud to say, though, that we have the most small dollar donations in this entire campaign. So we can get big ones, we can get small ones too, and we're fighting for small ones. We know how important it is, no matter the dollar amount, for someone to say, I want to support them. That means something. They're invested in it. Right? So we're proud of the fact that we've raised that $1.5 million, and we're going to use it all, and then some, uh, to make sure that we can get and connect with everybody in this district. It's critically important. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Doing a time check. Yeah. <clears throat> one, one more. Okay. Sorry, so we have time for one more. I'm going to go to the gentleman in the back with the hat on, who I know had his hand up for quite some time. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, I'm not indulging in stereotype if I assume you're not a Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I, I'm Norwegian, and, and you're, 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 you're welcome to the, you'll know, be welcome to the tribe. My father's Norwegian. So, uh, uh, this this is a continuation please. of the last one. Name? How, how, Your oh, name. I'm Larry baden -Dyke. I'm from New Paltz. Uh, how can you advise us, help us here, some of us Norwegians, really address <laughs> and talk about race. We're gonna need some help in that. There aren't enough of us here. And it seems that the conversation has been complicated recently by the whole notion of appropriation, which makes it difficult for Norwegians to talk about black experience somehow. You know, W.E. Du Bois said that um, his goal was America had to become a, a culture of African and Christian and white uh, culture they had to be put together. So anything you can t help us with this conversation? How do we go about, how do we deal with these people? Well, I mean, I, I, I think I spoke a little bit to this question um, from the earlier question. So here's what I'll say, you know, and again, um, there's no doubt that uh, there's a problem of race in this country. Um, let, me, let me do it this way. So I was at a, at a bagel fest uh, in Sullivan County. Uh, you ever been to a bagel fest in Sullivan County? Damn good, I enjoy it. Uh, I love a good bagel. My wife is African American and Jewish, so we, we, throw, down, we throw down on the bagels. Um, so I was in Sullivan County, and I was sitting in the Democratic Committee tent. Um, and a man walked in, an old gentleman, uh, and somebody said, hey, this guy's running for Congress, you should, you should meet him. And I knew pretty early on that I was dealing with a Trump voter um, when he looked at me and said, well, you know, Trump's uh, first two months in office, 200 jobs. What do you guys say about that? Uh, and I said, you know, well, it's a good thing I'm not running against Trump. I'm running against John Fazio. Do you know who he is? 
So yeah, I knew is, but what did he do that so bad? I said, well, he tried to take away health care from thousands of folks in this district, people you probably know. And here's where it gets interesting. Uh, he said, well, you can read between the lines here all you want, uh, but folks with gold teeth uh, who drive nice cars, uh, they're on Medicaid. Uh, and there's a lot of fraud right now uh, in Medicaid. Now, as an African American, uh, I could take that statement any number of ways. Uh, but I chose in that moment to put that aside and not judge him. I just said, hey, listen, let's assume that there's fraud. Okay? I'm happy to agree with that. I'm not sure I do, but let's just put it to the side for now. What about the folks who are legitimately relying on Medicaid? What do you do about that? Is the right way to deal with this to throw them off the rolls? No, of course not. Great, we are in agreement. He shook my hand, he laughed, had a little smile about it, and everybody left. He walked away. I thought that was the end of the conversation. Now I'm eating my bagel, poppy seed. <laughs> he, five minutes later, he tracks me down, hits me on my shirt, I turn around to him, and he says, you know what, man? You keep fighting. I like you. <laughs> but here's the lesson, and this speaks to your question. Both black, white, whatever. I had to listen for the common ground. Um, there's a lot of prejudgment in our culture right now. Uh, everybody's sensitive. And, 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 and you can say the one little wrong thing and people jump on your throat. Uh, and a lot of folks on the right, conservative folks, uh, for, folks who, you know, um, might look or sound a certain way or whatever the case might be, and people assume things. Um, and we come in as progressives sometimes with a sort of holier-than-thou attitude, sort of preaching from the mountaintop how they ought to be. Well, who are we? We're people too, right? We have our flaws and imperfections. Um, so it's important that we do the work of humbling ourselves in these conversations. Um, and I think part of being a leader, uh, and a political leader, which I take incredibly seriously, uh, is leading by example in that regard. Uh, you know, I'm not here uh, to take the bait. Uh, I'm here to find the common ground uh, and to bridge the gap. Uh, and that's how you can build coalitions uh, and transcend race uh, and then ultimately have real conversations about race. Because as soon as I get past that point of discomfort, and we find some common ground, now I'm seen as just a person, as a guy he likes. And we can then talk about race if I want to. Let's bring it back, let's circle back to that discussion we had before. And have a whole different vibe about it. But you gotta be willing to put that work in to do that. Amen. We apologize for that, but we'll give you 30 seconds, and this is where Tara will bring that cowbell. Just to give a final, final wrap up. Not as quick as that first five. Right? No. Well, this, I, I, mean, I tried to cover as much as I could in my answers to give you a sense of who I am as a person. Um, so I'm only going to use the time I have here to ask for your support. Um, it's 2018, people. The time is here. Uh, I spent uh, all of last year building for this moment. Uh, raising money, learning the issues, getting out there across the district, uh, challenging myself to be the best version of myself. Uh, my partner Lacey right now is not here, uh, but she was bent right there with me every step of the way. And I can only begin to tell you how much she's had to sacrifice along the way. Um, so we're excited. Uh, I am super charged to get this done. Um, and I hope that you can feel that. Um, because at the end of the day, what I've learned through this process is a lot of folks but with their heart. Uh, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, you want to hope people use reason. Uh, but we are human, and we do, we are moved by emotion. Uh, but you want that emotion to be the right kind. Not anger, not angst, love, compassion, empathy, understanding. Uh, that's what we need right now in our politics. And I'm hoping that if you walk away with anything today, uh, you understand that that's what's breathing inside of me. That's what's moving inside of my heart. Uh, and I come here humbly before you to ask for your support, knowing that if we come together, we will not be defeated. Thank you. Thank you.